In this training, we're going to cover entanglement. It's a skill that every firefighter should train on, especially when you take into account the ever-increasing danger of lightweight construction and the collapse and debris fields that can result from it. Now, obviously, avoidance and prevention is critical, but firefighters still need to be prepared for these types of situations if and when they occur. In this video, we're going to take a look at some of the tools that are available and conduct some performance testing. We'll also demonstrate some positional and assessment techniques that will help you contend with these types of situations. Before we get into tools and performance testing, I want to take a look at some of the materials that present an entanglement hazard. First of all, we have our electrical wiring. And as we all know, electrical wires come in a huge variety of types, sizes, and gauges. When we look at our smaller to medium gauge wire, pretty much any tool that we purchase is going to be able to cut through these types of wires without a problem. It's when we step up to our larger gauge wires that we're going to start to have some difficulty. Looking at Romex, if you're not familiar with it, Romex has a plastic or rubber sheath that covers up or protects the individual wires, anywhere from three to four. This material is still very flexible, just like our smaller or medium diameter wire, but it's the mass that's going to pose us a problem and difficulty for a lot of the tools that are out there. When we go to the next level, probably the worst wire that we're going to encounter is BX. Similar concept to the Romex, except that the outer sheath or shroud is made out of metal. Flexible, but tends to retain its shape. This material is extremely tough, and only a handful of tools are going to be able to cut through it. Beyond our electrical wiring, another material that's being used more and more frequently in both residential and commercial settings is the flexible duct. It's comprised of the outer foil, insulation, and inside core is the duct itself. It's held in place with plastic. Once all this material melts away, you're left with a big, long, coiled slinky. It's been found that in one foot of a six inch diameter duct, you can have as much as 13 feet of this high tensile strength steel. When all this material melts away, This is what you're left with. This was from an actual fire. This was from an 8 inch diameter duct. About 6 feet was cut out. And this is what you see here. Huge entanglement hazard. Another material that's often overlooked in entanglement situations is the grid or framework of a drop ceiling. Just like wires, this comes in a variety of sizes and gauges of metal. From your smaller, lightweight, to medium gauge, all the way up to heavy gauge. The problem with the framework is when you're involved in a collapse, this material can get bent and distorted around you, just like wires. And there's an, only a handful of tools that are going to be able to cut through this material effectively. Taking a look at tools, there are quite a few in the market that can be used to assist with entanglements. Obviously because of time constraints, we can't evaluate them all but what I did try to do is present a diverse selection of many of the types of tools that firefighters are currently carrying. First one I want to take a look at is the Leatherman type tools. These are very popular among firefighters because of their compact size and multiple functions. Also because a lot of them provide wire cutting capability, a lot of firefighters are carrying this as their primary tool to deal with entanglements. Some of the drawbacks though is that with firefighting gloves these tools can be diff difficult to access open and operate with firefighting gloves on. Also because of the size and the location of the cutter, these tools are really only effective on smaller gauge wire. You're going to have problems when you get to the larger gauge simply because the jaws aren't large enough to accommodate the wire. And they're going to be completely ineffective on your larger gauge material, BX and your ceiling grid framework. And so these tools are very limited. The next tool I want to take a look at is a side cutter. Now the side cutters come in all shapes and sizes. This is a larger cutter with a standard handle design. You can also get the spring loaded, which a lot of firefighters prefer simply because the tool constantly resets itself and makes it easier to cut multiple wires more efficiently. The side cutter works great on a huge range of wires. It's going to cut through your high tensile strength steel of the flexible duct, going to get through your copper wire without a problem. When you start to get to your larger gauge, such as Romex, with the smaller cutters, you may have to take a couple stabs on it. 
You may even use two hands, but it'll still get through and do the job. The side cutter, even the larger ones, are going to fall short on your BX. The best you're going to be able to do is crimp it. And even on your light gauge, drop ceiling grid framework, you're just going to be able to bend it. And that's it. The next tool that I want to take a look at is the light to medium duty cable cutter. This tool specifically is the Channel Ox Rescue 89. A multi-function tool, has five applications. You have the spanner wrench, window punch, pry bar, cavity for gas shutoffs. The end that uh, we're concerned about is the cutter. And it works great on a huge range of materials. No problem with the high tensile strength steel, the flexible duct, copper wire, goes through Romex like butter, and it will even tackle the BX. You may need two hands to do it, but it's going gonna, it's gonna to cut through this material. One of the few cutters that will do it. It also is effective on light gauge, drop ceiling grid framework, and medium gauge. Got to work a little harder on the medium gauge, but it'll still do the job. It does fall short on the heavy gauge framework. It tends to just roll over. It just doesn't get enough strength, enough bite to cut this material. The drawback to this tool probably is its size and weight. It's 11 inches long, weighs over a pound and a half, and it's not cheap. You're going to spend anywhere from $40 to over $60 on this tool. An alternative is just a standard cable cutter. This tool is a little lighter, a little smaller. It's 9.5 inches long, weighs over a pound. Uh, I found this one at Menards for $13. Going to cut the same range of materials. Now, a lot of firefighters don't feel comfortable carrying this as their primary tool in their turnout gear simply because of their size and their weight. If that's the case, I would still highly recommend using these tools, placing one or two in an entanglement kit for your rapid intervention team, simply because they are so effective on a huge range of materials. Both these tools will even cut through cyclone fencing. The last tool that I want to take a look at is the Fiskars Multi-Snip. Now this tool is getting more and more difficult to find simply because Fiskars no longer makes it, but it's an outstanding tool, very lightweight, compact, easy to operate with a firefighting glove on, spring loaded, has a locking feature. We added a, a lanyard, lanyard keeper and, and some reflective striping. This tool going to cut through smaller gauge wire, no problem. Going to even be able to tackle your Romex. It's going to fall short on your BX. It's not going to be able to cut it. The, the blades just aren't strong enough, but it will get through your light in medium gauge drop ceiling grid framework, even better than the light to medium gauge cable, or cable cutters that we showed you. One thing, the big advantage of this tool is that it's going to get you through your heaviest gauge drop ceiling grid framework. Again, you may have to work at it, but it's one of the only tools besides the tin snips that cuts through ceiling grid framework with ease. The other material that this cutter falls short on besides the BX is your high tensile strength steel, the flexible duct. It just tends to roll over. The one other advantage of this tool is when it's fresh and the blades aren't damaged, it's one of the only tools that's going to cut through fabric, get through SVA, adjustment straps, leather, etc. Regardless of what type of tool you decide to carry, you just have to recognize its strengths, its weaknesses, its limitations, and practice on it to see what it's going to work and be effective on. These are the types of tools that I carry. I carry the Fisker multi-snip and a mini side cutter as my primary tools. Regardless of the type of tool or tools you decide to carry, you want to store them in your turnout gear in a location that's going to allow quick and easy access. Now there's a lot of options out there, but probably one area that you should avoid is the pockets of your turnout coat, which can be covered up and obstructed by your SVA waist strap or an escape or utility belt, such as the one that I'm carrying. Regardless of what location you choose, you just want to avoid burying that tool 
so you can get to it without too much trouble. 